Um, so over to Professor Sato um, from Osaka University. Thank you very much for joining this panel. Um, this is a, a panel uh, sponsored by the Korea Foundation. And um, I have a few caveats about the, this, uh, this panel itself because um, it is actually, we have a, a project uh, called uh, Korea and Japan in the evolving uh, US-China relations. And therefore, it's, it's really um, more to do with uh, stuff in uh, uh, Northeast Asia, but also uh, about the changing dynamics of uh, the, the China-US uh, relations, which are actually affecting all of us, not just Korea and Japan, but all of us, because this really is about uh, the sort of vying for hegemony or leadership um, of a particular order and how uh, uh, between the US-led liberal order and whatever order that China uh, is trying to establish in this region. This Korea Foundation project is actually quite important uh, because it is the first of this kind where um, it is the, the, the graduate school that is receiving funding, but it is managed outside of the university uh, financial regulations. So um, the, the purpose of setting up the IFO Research Center in partnership with IFO was precisely to do things with greater flexibility um, when we run these international collab research collaboration projects. So um, this is actually a the first for us and it's actually quite exciting and i'm also very very excited uh, for this project because we do have uh, a lineup of uh, of very good scholars uh, in the field of international politics international relations we are going to address this covid 19 situation because i believe that we believe that this brings out in uh sort of stark relief uh the the impact of this particularly collapsing global order when neither the uh, Americans are unwilling or incapable of taking leadership. And at the same time, we have uh, China also sort of trying to showcase what they are able to do, and yet not um, the global community, or at least even in East Asia, uh, we are a bit uh, apprehensive about subscribing to what the Chinese are able to do. And so um, this is a, a, in part a, a way to uh, showcase our project as well as the people who are involved in it, but at the same time to present a view as uh, Joe had mentioned earlier um, about the Asians, uh, the Asian perspective on this uh, COVID-19 pandemic which I believe also is being sort of dominated by the sort of uh, Western narrative and also seeing uh, the, the Asian communities particularly being able to respond better, so to speak, uh, partly because we, we apparently are all sort of have authoritarian uh, tendencies. And um, I'm hoping that this panel uh, would have at least a way of addressing this situation and saying that Asia isn't a monolith. It isn't all about being authoritarian, although of course, uh, many Asian societies may prefer order to some sort of uh, um, uh, a free sort of liberal uh, individualistic societies. Nonetheless, um, I think that we will be able to demonstrate that all of the Asian countries dealt here, um, except for uh, China at the moment, um, have not really gone to the forceful lockdown. Um, and I will be briefly speaking about Japan in a minute, um, but I do think that the way that Asia has Asian countries have responded also have a very important lesson and as well as uh, an informative power towards reconstructing uh, or at least uh, keeping up uh, the, the workings of these uh, global institutions. So um, this is basically the background 
in which uh, this panel was convened. And um, my uh, panelist fellow project um, uh, participants have kindly agreed um, to actually sort of go a bit off of their main uh, project research, but um, address uh, do this panel um, at this on this occasion. So um, I'm actually going to first um, introduce uh, the the panelists and basically the 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 order in which they will be speaking and on what topic. So first, um, after me, uh, we have um, Li Ming Zhang from uh, the, the RSIS Nanyang Technological University in Singapore, and he will be talking about the the domestic um, public health governance in China, which I think uh, merits uh, a lot more critical as well as uh, sort of objective um, uh, analysis. And this is really, uh, I think, very, very important as we all project uh, and try and think about the future of, of anything that um, uh, relates to uh, governance issues. And then second up is uh, uh, Kay Koga. Uh, he is also at the, not at RSIS, but also at the uh, Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. He's Japanese um, and, and a good friend of mine also. And um, he will be actually presenting uh, the Southeast Asian regional perspective uh, from limitations and possibilities of cooperation. And you will have to forgive me in this day of uh, uh, political correctness and uh, cultural appropriations and whatever that a Japanese is presenting on Southeast Asia. Uh, but um, I have, uh, first of all, as I said, this uh, whole project was not really conceived to have uh, uh, to deal with Southeast Asia, primarily on uh, Korea, Japan, uh, US and China. Um, but at the same time, uh, Kay uh, is, uh, he's one of the, the experts on uh, multilateralism in this region. He has published extensively on uh, ASEAN, like Japan Corporation or the regional order. And apart from, you know, the inability to give all the country perspectives uh, uh, in, in ASEAN, um, I think he is as good as anybody to present uh, this regional, uh, the ASEAN perspective on how uh, the region co co uh, coped or coped coping with and uh, with the, the pandemic. Third, we have uh, Yang Jiangfeng from, uh, he is also Chinese, but he is based in Seoul at uh, Yonsei University. And he will be talking about uh, US-China uh, relations uh, and the possibility of functional cooperation as it has been sort of uh, questioned in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Fourth up is uh, Ms. June Park. Uh, she's the researcher at the National Research Foundation of Korea. She is also based in Seoul. And she will actually be looking at, because she's a political economist, um, and she will be looking at the production network breakdown and the South Korea sort of early response and testing. And so uh, this, this will be also kind of a forward-looking uh, presentation that will probably sound alarms and what to expect uh, in the post-COVID-19 uh, world. Fifth, uh, we have uh, Professor Jae Woo Chu uh, from uh, Kyung Hee University, and he will also uh, be talking about uh, the US-China uh, uh, relations, but from a different perspective of uh, from um, Yang. Sorry. And finally, we have uh, Brendan Howe from Ewas Women's University. Uh, who actually he will be looking at something that I think is very much sort of links this project to the main to this panel uh, to to the main uh, project itself, which is looking at the sort of the role of middle powers, uh, including the uh, Korea as a new way forward. Asian perspectives in the larger context of uh, US China rivalry 
and to what extent that they pose an opportunity for these middle-sized powers, including but particularly Korea and perhaps Japan, uh, in, in laying down uh, new modes of uh, international cooperation. Now I'm going to sort of switch over and talk very briefly about uh, Japan's response, um, which I am sure that uh, many of you are aware that we do have uh, one of the lowest death rates, but also we have the lowest uh, test testing uh, numbers. And we have also uh, been, in a way, muddling through. I don't actually want to go into the details of what we did or we did not do, but in the early phases of, of the pandemic, Japan did have one of the, the bigger clusters in that um, uh, earlier in January uh, of the, um, the Princess Diamond uh, cruise ship, which had about 3,000 passengers. And so it was kind of called the, the, the Petri dish uh, of, of the COVID-19 uh, epidemic. Um, and uh, the, the one thing that I think um, it's, it's very, very common among all the, the, the countries that responded to COVID is that it really demonstrated the degree of uh, public trust and the ability of the political leadership either to live up to it or completely fail. And this says something, uh, two things about Japan that I, um, I really want to impart to, to all of you is that um, the Japanese case was a demonstration in what one sense of the complete futility of um, our prime minister's sort of very uh, aggressive sort of leadership that he was trying to uh, project in the seven years of being uh, prime minister. Uh, he was very big on uh, security issues. Uh, he was arguing for a constitutional revision in order to be prepared and respond to threats from China or from North Korea and so on and so forth. And But the funny thing happened uh, when an administration is, is so worked up on being the sort of the security, national security um, government had utterly failed to conceptualize this pandemic as a national security threat. Our National Security Council was convened way, way late in, in sometime in late February for the first time. Um, I would have thought uh, that this would have been an opportunity to demonstrate what a national security threat is. Only a couple of years ago, uh, the Japanese government was all up on uh, being prepared uh, for an emergency situation in preparing for a possible uh, missile attack from North Korea. They installed this system called J-Alert, basically warning everybody that a missile is on its way. So there was a lot of these sort of hoo-ha and hype about uh, security issues. Uh, and also that same year, uh, we had th this huge um, typhoon and earthquake that hit Kansai, which also led to an introduction of these emergency measures uh, that can uh, be installed in case of disasters. Um, so it was not as if uh, the tools weren't there, but for some reason, um, and I can only surmise it to their lack of imagination or a complete lack of understanding what security issues are, uh, the government basically delegated um, all responsibilities and decision makings to, first of all, to the Ministry of Health, and then basically to all the local governors. And as you may have known, uh, particularly the Tokyo, the governor of Tokyo, uh, Koike Yuriko, uh, was actually picking up on this security narrative of things and was saying and pleading uh, Abe Shinzo to declare the state of emergency sooner than later. Likewise, uh, if you come to, to the, gov uh, the other cluster, which was in the Kansai area, which includes Kyoto, Osaka, and Hyogo, uh, which are 
these governors also had a sense of uh, urgency, which the national government was completely sort of not responding to. So we've had a lot of problems. And I'm not going to make any judgments about whose model has worked better than anybody, uh, whether you go for a complete lockdown or you sort of have a midway like in Japan, where so much was reliant on sort of local initiatives and also in good faith of the citizens, the people to behave properly. Um, the point is that um, I do believe that um, this is something that should and probably would uh, bring in uh, uh, some serious reckoning of, of, of how um, our government, particularly uh, Abesan's government, um, has been sort of really not being with things. He was obviously uh, very worried about um, whether uh, Japan can hold the, the Olympic Games in 2020, and then of course it got postponed to 2021. But for the lack of, of any sort of uh, initiative or even a sort of a good public relations policy in disseminating information about this crisis, um, he is one of the very few leaders when all other leaders, basically, even in Europe, have managed to ride on the tails of this COVID crisis to actually sort of uh, win uh, public support. His uh, popularity support rate has plunged um, to, to, a, to a level that I don't think he's, this cabinet has been in in a few years. Uh, so this 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 presents a very interesting sort of domestic situation for Japan, and in terms of sort of as a as a as a as an international policy, uh, the other thing that was very worrying about um, this government was that it failed to actually really cooperate with Korea. Um, of course, the the Korea Japan relations had been plunging to the, its depth too um, for for some time particularly since last year uh, because of, of, of Abe, Abe governments uh, that started off with uh, the ban on uh, export materials to Korea. But at the same time, this would have been the, the perfect opportunity to actually override all of these historical animosities and differences uh, to cooperate more, particularly because um, Ch the Chinese and the Korean tourists, the interaction between these three countries are the most numerous, and they do affect us economically as well as socially and politically. So um, I'm, I'm very much uh, was uh, disappointed that regardless of the lack of leadership in terms of, you know, to, domestically uh, leading the country to, to some form of uh, uh, a formula of containing the COVID-19 uh, spread is one thing. But the other thing is, and particularly because he was so much about uh, putting Japan back on the map, uh, international map, and uh, sort of trying to exercise some leadership role in the region through the Indo-Pacific uh, policies and whatnot, that um, he's also failed in this field uh, to actually take this as an opportunity to improve relations within, uh, particularly with uh, South Korea. So um, these are my observations about Japan. And, uh, but as I said, we, our response then a bit of an anomaly. Uh, I just want to demonstrate Japan as a case of where the leadership uh, failure was a bit cataclysmic. Um, so uh, there isn't really much of a case uh, at the moment to, to present uh, in terms of a model. So um, with this, I'm going to now hand over uh, to, to Li Ming Zhang to, to present on his case about public health governance in China. Well, thank you very much, Haruko. Um... Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's really nice to uh, see everyone online and have this opportunity to um, exchange views. Um, in the case of China, I think everybody knows very well by now that 
um, there were two phases in China's response to uh, COVID-19. Uh, from late December last year to early January this year, uh, there were many problems uh, and there were many um, issues and loopholes as well. But uh, after the end January, uh, we've seen um, uh, a very complete uh, sort of paradigm of Chinese government's response to the pandemic and a lot of uh, very uh, stringent, even forceful measures were taken uh, and say so it was a whole of government's uh, sort of approach in response to the, uh, the, the virus. And of course, everybody knows the results. Um, in China, this pandemic is still an issue, but uh, it's not as serious as um, we can we can see in many other countries. Um, I think many of us probably understand very well the success part of China's response to the pandemic. But I I think um, maybe at the problems, um, uh, some of the even mistakes uh, that China had. Um, uh, demonstrated in, in, in the two uh, or first two or three weeks in, in, in January. So I want to focus on, on these um, aspects um, um, in, the, in the context of China. So basically, I wanted to explain why uh, from early January to roughly January 20th, uh, China made those mistakes and, um, and, and why we had those problems in China. Um, there could be many things that we can talk about. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, I, I believe that China's public health uh, crisis management system has not been very well developed. Uh, a lot of the weaknesses and loopholes that we see in the Chinese system are perhaps also common in other countries I've seen in the past few months. Uh, in the fight against the pandemic in, in, in many countries. Um, but, but that's not the, the main point I, I'm going to talk about. And you can also perhaps make the argument that um, the failures in the first few weeks in January could be related to some of the political developments in China in recent years. Uh, the some sort of some sort of um, some of the new uh, patterns of interactions, relationships between central political leadership and local government leaders. And in general, central government, local government relations as well. Um, you can also um, argue that it has something to do with culture, uh, for instance, and even the special occasion, um, you, know, uh, you know, 25th, was the Chinese uh, New Year. So this sort of the, the festival um, uh, timing probably made a difference uh, uh, for China's response to the pandemic in, in, during those weeks as well. But again, I'm not gonna get into the details of those things. I wanted to zoom in and focus on the specific governance, public health crisis governance measures during those weeks and try to explain um, what really went wrong, okay? And again, um, there, are, there are many things, even if you wanna talk about uh, China's public health crisis governance, I wanna focus on two things. Uh, I'm not sure everybody understands this too, but I thought it would be interesting to, uh, uh, to uh, have a discussion on this. Basically, the two things that I'm gonna talk about are things about uh, sort of the mentality or traditional way of doing things um, uh, by Chinese officials, especially at the local context when it comes to crisis situation, whether it's a, um, uh, a mining disaster or some collapse of a mining facility leading to death of people or a serious environmental pollution crisis or a um, mass demonstration in, in some of the big cities. We've seen these things, uh, uh, these this, this two ways of dealing with crisis for a long, long time. 
And uh, you would be surprised uh, to, to hear what I'm going to see next. You know, in, the, in the case of uh, COVID-19 in the early weeks, the local officials uh, in Wuhan basically made the same mistakes. Okay. Now, what are the two uh, ways of doing things or handling crisis? Uh, one, the so-called um, tense internally and loose externally. You know, uh, let me very briefly explain. You know, whenever you had a crisis uh, at a locality, the local government or government leaders will try to pretend in, in an open um, uh, fashion that it's not a serious problem. It's just a small issue. It's something we can um, effectively control and manage. So no panic, no worry, no need for higher authority or higher level political leadership to come down, investigate or whatever. Uh, so they will, they will try to do a lot of things to pretend that it's not really a crisis. It's not a, even a big issue. It's just a small issue. It's an internal issue. Uh, so they will do a lot of things, uh, whether cover up uh, or uh, create uh, sort of like a, 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 a uh, situation that uh, sends out a signal that there's nothing very serious to worry about. Um, but internally, they will do uh, certain things to try to cope with the crisis. And the second uh, way of doing things or traditional uh, thinking when it comes to crisis is uh, the so-called um, stability maintenance. And again, for a long time, the local uh, leaders in China uh, have been very careful that uh, you know, they should do everything possible to maintain social and political stability. So let me, uh, let me try to give you some facts. Uh, 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 in the first few weeks in January, uh, in the process of uh, the local um, Wuhan government and the Hubei provincial government's handling of the crisis and to, to demonstrate uh, that indeed, these two sort of mindsets or traditional ways of doing things had a lot to do with the failures and mistakes during those weeks. So look at stability and maintenance first. Um, everybody uh, now knows the story of Dr. Li Wenliang, right? The whistleblower, one of the eight whistleblowers who were um, criticized, uh, admonished by the police. And um, if you read some of the uh, official statements, uh, in the first week of January, uh, after January 3rd, when Dr. Lee was sort of penalized by the local police, their explanations were exactly uh, in the efforts trying to justify the punishment of Dr. Lee on the ground of social stability. It's not just the local officials, local police leaders. You look at uh, one article that was published by the Supreme Court, for instance, and that's the highest legal organization in China. On January 28th, uh, the Supreme Court released a statement in response to um, you know, people's questions about uh, Dr. Lee's punishment. The court's uh, statement says that Dr. Lee deserved the punishment. Why? Because he was uh, disclosing this message publicly, but the message was not entirely accurate and his action was causing social instability. So that's why uh, the punishment of Dr. Lee was, uh, was, was acceptable and justifiable. And uh, a doctor, uh, at uh, another doctor at Wuhan Central Hospital, uh, Dr. Ai Fen, he was also one of the eight uh, whistleblowers. Uh, he was admonished. He was re-scolded by his hospital party secretary, uh, Ms. Tsai Li. And the, uh, the remarks that uh, the party secretary made to Dr. Ai Feng was, I'm, I'm going to translate the two sentences. 
uh, he scolded Dr. Effingman, you are a criminal uh, for um, affecting the social stability in Wuhan city. And you are uh, liable uh, for your action because what you did uh, would destroy uh, Wuhan's development prospect. So if you, if, you, if, you, if you look at these remarks, these statements, uh, clearly um, local officials, people who are in charge of uh, at the front line um, uh, dealing with the pandemic, uh, had in their minds that social stability, maintaining social stability should be more important than everything else. Okay. And uh, in, in February and March, uh, a lot of uh, Chinese media reports also reported many doctors in the local hospital in Wuhan were um, warned uh, really by the authorities that they should not disclose anything, they should not engage in the discussion about the um, virus uh, in public platform or on new social media platforms. And again, the message was be careful about social stability. Okay. So uh, those were things that were happening to the doctors. Um, and everybody knows that um, from January 6th to uh, January 17th, the local public health authorities in Wuhan did not uh, publish any report about new cases or new contagions in the city. And that was very bizarre. And of course, I think uh, we understand the reason behind that failure of reporting was because uh, there were the two sort of political meetings. First in Wuhan, the, the two uh, meetings, two sessions in Wuhan, and then um, next the two uh, sessions uh, uh, in the province of Hubei. So clearly um, maintaining social stability um, really uh, led to a uh, lot of failures in, 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 in the early days of this crisis. Now, next, um, uh, tense internally, loose externally. Um, what are the facts? Well, uh, internally, it's, it's actually quite um, uh, um, interesting to know that the local Wuhan government and their public health authorities actually did quite a lot of things in the first few weeks of January. And they did those things internally. For instance, they did come up with internal notifications and internal guidelines that were distributed to the hospitals and the doctors, telling them what to watch out, what to do, and what information to collect and analyze and submit to the local public health authorities. And they also did certain mobilization of the grassroots organizations and neighborhood committees, et cetera, et cetera. So they did um, do these things and it's an illustration of sort of intense um, internally. But at the same time, um, they also did a lot of things to create a situation, an atmosphere externally that it's not a serious issue, you know, don't panic, don't worry. Uh, and there are a lot of facts uh, in, in, in this regard. For instance, uh, the, the first two invest, investigation teams sent by the central government to Wuhan uh, in, in early January and mid-January did not really uh, have actual access to the doctors and actual uh, reliable information about um, the, the, the uh, pandemic. Uh, in human-to-human in -human, uh, uh, transmission in particular. And the local governments, even by mid-January, did a lot of open things, for instance, like um, uh, you know, gathering, the celebration of Chinese New Year, et cetera, et cetera. So um, uh, there were a lot of these things, uh, you know, uh, uh, tense internally and loose inter uh, externally. So I, I, I believe those sort of like you know, traditional ways of dealing with crisis uh, have facilitated, or have really uh, instigated some of these failures uh, during those weeks. 
and that was part of the, the reason or reasons why um, a precious period of time was lost. So I'll stop here, Baruko. Sorry, I can add uh, some more details later to Q and A. Thanks. Okay. So now we'll we'll have uh, K. Uh, thank you for your uh, the uh, introduction, and also the uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to the uh, uh, this uh, conference. Uh, I think like this is the first time for me to do the uh, our web conference, so hopefully like this goes uh, well. But the uh, um, my kind of presentation focus on the uh, um, Southeast Asian region uh, response to the uh, COVID uh, nineteen. Uh, but the uh, again the uh, Southeast Asia is uh, has the uh, ten countries, and also the it's pretty difficult to comprehend everything uh, in the uh, short this, uh, the, uh, presentation. So I will focus on the uh, particularly ASEAN, like regional organization, ASEAN, and also the uh, uh, its uh, geopolitical implications uh, 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 for the, uh, the uh, COVID-19. Um, so first of all, let me uh, talk about the uh, current narrative on the uh, international organization. Uh, it's something like this. Uh, the, uh, first of all, uh, U.S.-China competition or rivalry is getting intensified. And second, uh, the uh, wild non-traditional security issues like COVID-19 uh, uh, should facilitate international organization, uh, but the uh, great power politics creates a divide in the world. And third, uh, this affects the international organizations, uh, particularly World Health Organization, WHO, and its uh, future prospect is somewhat bleak. And uh, this is, uh, for example, the uh, U.S. is accusing WHO of being the uh, China's puppet and the uh, attempted to withdraw its financial support. And given U.S. as the uh, number one funder for WHO, that consists of the 15% of the uh, total budget in WHO, uh, which is, I think, the, uh, around the $4 billion. And this would have the uh, significant uh, impact on the effectiveness of the organization. So um, this is a general kind of uh, the narrative on the uh, international organizations, particularly uh, WHO. But the, uh, um, just uh, we uh, should wonder, uh, how about the uh, regional organizations like ASEAN? And does it lose the, uh, some uh, effectiveness uh, because of the uh, great power competition uh, under the uh, COVID-19? And uh, my answer is uh, not necessarily, uh, and then rather uh, ASEAN now has an opportunity to enhance the, its institutional principle, uh, ASEAN centrality, and then the, uh, somewhat mitigate the, uh, uh, the competition or rivalry between the uh, great powers, if the association uh, proactively sees this opportunity. And uh, Vietnam, uh, the ASEAN chair uh, in 2020, uh, this year, uh, plays pivotal role. And uh, I think the, there are uh, three reasons for that. Now, first of all, uh, the weakening the global institutions uh, becomes the uh, factor to strengthen the regional organizations. Uh, why? Because the regional states no longer entirely rely on the, uh, um, uh, the global institution for uh, getting the uh, collective uh, public goods, and they became more uh, self-reliant uh, regionally. And ASEAN has been very active in generating diplomatic supports uh, from inside and outside and facilitated information sharing, including uh, best practice and the past experiences. Uh, because ASEAN member state experienced a certain health crisis in the past, such as SARS and then the H5N1, uh, they set up the several institutional mechanisms already, uh, such as the uh, ASEAN Emergency Operations Center uh, network, uh, ASEAN EOC network, and ASEAN plus three field um, epidemiology, uh, the uh, uh, training network, FETN, and ASEAN Biodiaspora uh, Regional Virtual Center, AVVC. So they have been actually uh, utilized actively since January uh, 2020. And they are obviously not perfect, but at least they can use this institution uh, uh, to uh, the, uh, enable, uh, use institution and enable regional states to um, effectively respond to the uh, those crisis. And second, uh, the utilities of these uh, regional institutions draw attention of the great powers and regional powers. In fact, the United States, China, Japan, Australia, and also South Korea have held the uh, uh, counter-COVID meetings uh, at least once with ASEAN since January 2020. And for China, 
China held the ASEAN China Emergency Meeting at the uh, Foreign Minister's level on February 20th, and the uh, ASEAN Plus 3 Meeting Summit uh, on the uh, uh, April 14th. Uh, they are often cited, so they are actually well known, but the uh, working level, uh, like senior official meetings, was also uh, held uh, from the early February um, through the ASEAN Plus 3 network. And China also provides some uh, financial and material uh, assistance to the ASEAN member states, uh, like Cambodia. And for its part, uh, the United States also began to uh, engage with Southeast Asia actively, although it is actually after the uh, uh, April. The United States held a uh, high-level interagency video conference with ASEAN on April 1st and provided the, around the uh, $18.3 million emergency and health assistance. Also, ASEAN held a foreign minister meeting late April and a health minister's meeting on the uh, uh, on the May 7th with the United States. So in other words, ASEAN became a useful platform uh, for great powers to interact with Southeast Asian states under the health, uh, the, uh, this health emergency, and they pay attention to the ASEAN. And third, uh, ASEAN, South, ASEAN and Southeast Asia uh, gradually makes a progress in dealing with the COVID-19. The number of infected and the death rate, uh, the, the deaths uh, remain relatively low, and then the Southeast Asian government now seeks for a way to relax their uh, lockdown measure. Uh, it is not clear whether uh, this can be called success or not because the uh, number sometimes number is sometimes deceptive because the uh, it could be the only the under uh, tested or like under reported. But the situation seems to be better uh, in uh, compared to in the comparison with the past, and uh, the characteristics of COVID nineteen becomes more clearer. Uh, uh, despite uh, not uh, the uh, vaccination yet. So what do these uh, tell us about uh, enhancing ASEAN centrality? So basically the uh, uh, ASEAN drew attention from the great power, major power. ASEAN is actually uh, doing uh, the, uh, its best in communicating uh, with the regional states and also the functionally, uh, they have certain kind of the mechanisms. So they have their certain kind of assets. Obviously, again, like it's not perfect, but there, there are some. And as such, uh, ASEAN keeps, can push forward uh, its centrality. But like then I think the, uh, what is important is ASEAN should actually take the um, kind of a one uh, important initiative uh, that is to create the uh, standard of a, a procedure uh, for the uh, health emergency uh, now and in the future too. Um, this is because today uh, we often advocate uh, the, for the uh, United Front, and international cooperation, and uh, sometimes criticize the uh, unilateral action without the consultation and lack of coordination. But these are the uh, all the time, I mean, the, uh, all true, but at the same time, without the uh, standard of procedure, uh, each, each state would not share what consequence it would face when a priority actually goes to their region, uh, not over the, uh, to the uh, nation. And also, the, uh, they, would not sh they are not sure uh, whether they could actually get the uh, more kind of compensation or uh, the, uh, something uh, like that uh, from the uh, regional uh, the, uh, organizations or global organization by doing so. Because the impact actually differs uh, the, uh, in each nation, they have always a dilemma. And but by creating a, a SOP, the standard of procedure for ASEAN and beyond, like the uh, ASEAN Plus 3, or East Asia Summit, ASEAN can stipulate the role of the uh, centrality, and then ASEAN can put uh, its actual opinion on that. And by doing so, I think the, uh, the uh, Vietnamese uh, chairperson's agenda setting power is uh, probably like, really, really important. So I know like, there are a bunch of the limitations that like, ASEAN faces, and then we, we, if I focus on that, probably like, I'm just gonna going to spend the uh, whole time like, saying like, <laughs> Cummings. So I'm just gonna uh, giving uh, some kind of possibility and then some actually the uh, uh, positive pro uh, perspective that like, ASEAN can provide. ASEAN actually has been uh, providing. And then the uh, implication for all like, other uh, uh, questions about ASEAN, uh, I think like, I can uh, talk about, uh, we can talk about in the Q&A session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great. Um, thank you for the opportunity. So I'm gonna go straight to my, um, to what I'm gonna talk talk about basically. Um, 
uh, my thesis is really about, the theme is really about the possibility of US-China cooperation with respect to, you know, pandemic and of course other global, global governance issues as well. Um, well, let me first talk about, you know, the nature of the game, the situation right now between the United States and China. And then I'm going to move to talk about the possibility of functional cooperation. And then lastly, I will use the, um, you know, the conduct and of course the behavior of the two governments during the time throughout the, uh, throughout the uh, crisis thus far. So let's move on to talk about the nature of the relationship. I understand with, you know, actually with what just happened over the past few days uh, in Hong Kong, there's this uh, rise and chorus of, uh, of describing you know, U.S.-China relations entering the Cold War, and of course, it's people have been talking about it ever since uh, Mike Pence raised the specter of that situation two years ago. Yeah, I, I think uh, personally, I think uh, it does uh, the, uh, describing the situation as Cold War does, of course, carry some uh, elements of truth. But on the other hand, I personally feel like it's a, it's kind of a distraction to argue, particularly you know when we talk about the Cold War, people are going to dispute and argue over the appropriateness of the comparison. But um, personally, I think it's just a waste of, a waste of time. It's kind of distracting. But then, if it's not Cold War, then what is it? How do we describe the situation, the the, the nature of a bilateral relationship? So I would say let's stop talking about. You know, I would say uh, the bottom line is um, you, we should throw out words like rivals, opponents, and competitors because these words, however uh, useful they are, they can be taken in sort of a benign sort of a situation, which can be used um, to apply to U.S.-China relations before, you know, before the Trump administration, actually. So actually, the, the better words, the, the, the words I would prefer to use are like adversaries, you know, it's it actually, it's more kind of, a, a, it's competition to some, still, of course, rivalry and blah, blah, blah. But then the nature, this sort of a mentality has totally changed to be, be to have become so adversarial as if, you know, the, uh, the, two, the two governments and of course, two countries are at each other's throat. So, uh, and of course, the crux of the problem is really that uh, the United States has really uh, Democrats and Republicans as well have, uh, you know, uh, actually people have been talking about floating about the idea that the only consensus in, in Washington these days is that uh, the U.S. should get tough on China, tougher on China, in the sense that, you know, China has become emerged as the exist existential threat to the United States. And of course, and of, uh, I'm sure some of you guys remember, just last year, the State Department Policy Planning Director used the reference of a clashes of civilization, to talk about China, uh, and of course, a relationship with China in more kind of ideological, racial, civil, civilizational tone. So I, I think, um, you know, talking about ideological, you know, to what extent, I, I mean, whether the Trump people are really Democrats or not, that, I mean, de Democrats in the, in the small d sort of sense is a totally different question. I, my, my sense is that if there's a second term for the Trump, uh, Trump administration, the United States might stop become, being a democracy, but that's a different question. But I think the, the nature of the relationship has entered such a period that, uh, that uh, the, the uh, relation, um, you know, at least from the US side, China is really like an exist, existential threat to the United States such that, uh, and of course, uh, the hunt against uh, uh, Huawei and of course, um, you know, even though they really don't have a smoking gun, of course, it's, uh, you know, the, the accusations against Huawei is really about what might happen if Huawei supplies all the telecom equipments to all these countries and blah, blah, blah. So, and of course, uh, in that respect, uh, what I've noticed that American officials, uh, particularly, you know, uh, you know uh, Mike Pompeo and of course other senior officials have increasingly used rhetorics and the words that uh, basically that, that they use to, to hit China where it hurts most, meaning they've been increasingly referring to China as, you know, actually not China per se, but the Communist Party. That's really hurting where it's uh, hitting where it hurts more, most. Actually, just in January, uh, Mike Pompeo was, uh, was quoted as saying, the Communist Party of China is the central threat of our time while he was in Germany trying to con convince those Germans to, to act against Huawei. 
So let's move, let me move on to talk about possibility of functional cooperation really from this Ernie Hart's sort of perspective, using functionalism, rationalism, blah, 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 basically, you know, from, from the ground up, talking about technical, you know, technical uh, uh, and scientific, scientific nature of cooperation that's kind of politically new, neutral, arising out of uh, collaboration, cooperation among like-minded scientists and scholars and this and that. Um, I think, I th uh, you know, uh, this latches on to my first segment. It's really about the nature of the uh, U.S.-China relations. The Chinese uh, government, and thus far, I mean, I mean, they have always been talking about win-win situation. It's just such a platitude and win-win cooperation, blah blah blah. I mean, it's like, um, yeah, I, I think they're still talking about. Uh, that goes on to my third section as well. Yet yeah, they'd like to cooperate to some extent. I think from the Chinese perspective. Uh, from the Chinese government's perspective, functional cooperation is still uh, a possible situation out there, except the, the Americans have no interest whatsoever. You know, again, you, you can compare the, the, the rhetoric from the two sides and the Chinese are still insisting, okay, win, 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 blah, 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 you know, cooperation. Um, I, I do believe, you know, how, well, however much you dislike the Chinese government's action or whatever, uh, I do believe they do want to cooperate to some extent and uh, uh, tinker with the existing global order of governance. But uh, I mean, cooperation in the United States is particular with respect to cooperating with China. The word cooperation has become such a bad word such that, you know, it's becoming analogous to a swear word. You know, nobody's talking about uttering this word in the US these days. Uh, and of course, that has a lot to do with the nature of the Trump administration. Uh, you know, the Republicans, they've become, and of course, you, you know, I think American scholars have been using um, words that are most um, uh, uh, apt and of course appropriate, like infantile, erratic, irresponsible, and you know, whatever. So I think, uh, you know, and of course, also because of the ideological adversarial, adversarial turn of the relationship, you know, the U.S., um, particularly those politicians and the, uh, at the highest level of the U.S. government have no interest whatsoever in, in terms of uh, cooperating with China, uh, even on the aspect, on the issues of technical and scientific uh, sort of nature. Again, you know, COVID-19 being one just an example. So, um, yeah, I, I think uh, that's why, to, uh, you know, the Chinese government, Chinese officials have been very frustrated and of course, they haven't really come up with a strategy in dealing with the United States because what happened just over the past few years, uh, I would characterize, I would characterize as a, a sort of a loss of paradigms in terms of mutual, uh, in terms of mutual dealings between the United States and China. Uh, the U.S. has rejected wholeheartedly the par the paradigm of engaging China, whereas the Chinese side have been really uh, taken surprise, taken by surprise by. By the harshness, by, by the by the vitriol with which the the Trump administration has hit at China again, the code, uh, uh, you know, the trade the trade war, and of course all the um, retaliations and against uh, Huawei or, or even the scientists and this and that. I don't want I don't need to go to those details. Well, uh, at the level of technical uh, technicality and you know scientific community, there was coordination. I mean, actually, the CDC director of the United States was quoted just um, a, a, you know, a couple of weeks ago saying that they had very good interactions with China. Uh, again, politics got in the way, therefore don't even count on any cooperation from the US side in extending the olive branch. And, but I think the Chinese are, are willing to cooperate in a multilateral setting, in global governance agenda, this and that. But uh, we can talk about those issues um, at the Q&A session. But. In the interest of time, I will go over briefly five points. Um, uh, the project that, uh, within the context of the project that we are engaging in right now, um, I'm trying to address the issue of COVID-19 COVID in relation to the supply chain risk and the acceleration of tra uh, trade wars plus tech wars, tech wars at the core of trade wars actually. And in the empirical analysis, what I'd like to focus on is on artificial intelligence, 
but with a more direct focus on digital currencies and also semiconductor chip production for artificial intelligence. But before I delve into those two issues, um, just briefly touching upon the supply chain issue, uh, I think it's become a norm for companies to actually realize how uh, avoiding the Chinese center, China, mainland China centered supply chain is very difficult actually, even if we consider the risk of another outbreak. But because the, the companies have now realized there is a risk banking on China as a main um, production um, site, there will be uh, future developments by companies that were producing in China to um, deflect, uh, to find alternative sites for production, if not withdrawing entirely from China. So having a second site or a third site would become the norm. And uh, the second point about supply chains is that the U.S. is trying to construct a supply network. It's called the EPN, Economic Prosperity Network, that departs from reliance on China. So, for example, um, South Korea has also been asked to participate in this, and it would stir quite a controversy, I think, domestically because of South Korea's continued uh, relationship with China, with North Korea involved and whatnot. Um, and the political breakup that may occur towards the re-election cycle, uh, for example, I'm using South Korea as another um, case, Shanghai Ming, the, the ambassador to, to Korea, uh, commenting that South Korea has been very favorable to China and expect that South Korea would answer favorably on Hong Kong issues, on one country, two systems issues, or the U.S. asking South Korea to actually participate in the EPN is going to be really a um, uh, uh, mind-boggling issue for decision makers in, in the Blue House. Um, now, moving on to some of the artificial intelligence issues and the digital regulatory framework that is not really in place. Uh, two things as empirical uh, things that we need to examine in the coming future. Digital currency. So, for example, uh, the Central Bank of China, so People's Bank of China, is set to release uh, the world's very first sovereign currency uh, within this year. And because no other country is ready to deal with this as of yet, uh, this would stir um, uh, not just controversies, but changes. It would bring about changes as to how countries actually view uh, sovereign um, digital currencies issued by the central bank. The central bank would be able to monitor the individual purchases more closely, and it would be able to surveil uh, people by their spendings more closely. Whether this would challenge the U.S. dollar is still, it remains to be seen, um, but the power of the central bank is going to be in question, and central bank independence issues would be uh, hugely discussed. Now, turning over to what um, other uh, scholars have been mentioning about U.S.-China divide, I think what's really missing in the discussion empirically is on semiconductors. Actually, it's at the heart of this, this uh, U.S.-China divide uh, and also South Korea-Japan divide if we go back to July of 2019 when Japan, upon the Supreme Court decision from South Korea for uh, compensation by Japanese firms on um, and comfort women issues as well. But let's leave that aside for a minute. There were three key items that were called into question. Uh, hydrogen fluoride, um, what's the other one, polyamide, and uh, also photoresist. So in the turn of one year, just one year and a half, Hydrogen fluoride and polyamides, they are going to be domestically produced, and they are being domestically produced, while photoresist, the domestic production, has not been really successful, and the U.S. is gaining that market by DuPont entering South Korea. Um, so what's in all of this? Who gets control of the leadership in quality chip production is really essential, in trying to understand who is going to gain leadership for artificial intelligence. Why? 
because the, the chips that would be needed, both non-memory and memory chips that would be used in robots, uh, that, use, that would be used in processors, they require significant amount of uh, energy efficiency as well as quality, of, quality in terms of speed, uh, in terms of thinking of the robots. So when we look at it from this point of view, it's very likely that Japan would stick with the US in terms of partnership, where uh, the US would try its best to cut South Korea's supply to China, especially from Samsung. And we've seen this happen from the Taiwanese case of TSMC. The Department of Commerce has already issued uh, an order for uh, blocking this, and the TSMC uh, folks have been uh, announcing that they would they would construct a factory in the United States and they would stop supply to Huawei. The same kind of order would be coming to Samsung in a matter of time. And lastly, uh, I'm just going to quickly touch upon what uh, Sato Sensei was mentioning about um, Japan-South Korea relations in terms of uh, COVID-19. So South Korea had an early response and they were based on lessons learned from MERS, um, uh, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome in 2015. And I agree wholeheartedly that the, the amalgamation of the explanation, just using Asian cases as a complete uh, authoritarian residue uh, kind of a framework is a big a misunderstanding. Actually, the kind of surveillance and conditional data, private data use uh, for tracking and contact tracing is only done by social contract because in 2015, there were people who died uh, from the, the infectious diseases and the, the legal provisions regarding inve infectious diseases prevention and control was established and amended in 2015 and onwards. And large scale RT uh, real time PCR testing was available because uh, there was a MERS precedent and production capacity was also there. Now, there, there is a question about how South Korea and Japan could actually uh, cooperate uh, effectively in this area. Um, we'll have to see with the evolve, evolving changes in the political leaderships of the two countries, but regarding the vaccines, let us just be uh, accepting of the fact that vaccine would, vaccines would never come because for mares, there was no, no vaccine. And in terms of this kind of a context, uh, we should brace for the kind of outbreaks that would come in a more quicker cycle. And vaccines that cannot be delivered uh, in uh, an expected time frame, I think people will be fighting more just by text testing and governments will gain more control. So I'll end there and I'll take any questions from the floor later on. So we're running out of time. I'm just gonna make my uh, statement short and brief. Uh, okay, uh, well, what I'm trying to say in my paper as of today is uh, I'm not as pessimistic as many observers would like to point out in the post COVID uh, world order or international system and so forth. Uh, remember, you know, in the first week of April, there was a article published in Foreign Policy, right? And then it was followed by a, a op-ed article by Henry Kissinger in Wall, Wall, Wall Street Journal. And these 13 experts and famous uh, scholars uh, were very pessimistic about the prospect of a future in a, international order following the COVID-19 situation, but uh, what I'd like to point out is uh, four things that they might have, they might have overlooked uh, uh, considering how we overcame in the past of a similar situation, whether it's a pandemic, uh, infectious uh, viruses, or, you know, even financial crisis too. Uh, we go back to, you know, 08 world financial crisis and 1997-98 uh, Asian financial crisis and so forth. And the world has learned the lesson very, uh, very smartly, I believe. And I think the cycle of recovery has been shortened and shortened as we experience a series of all, all these uh, 
crisis that is uh, very damaging to humanity. And since the cycle has been shortened, I think uh, lessons were, I, I think it reflects that, you know, we have learned the lessons in a very smart way. And the second point is uh, there's going to be an early bird of a, a economic recover, recovery, right? It looks like China is on the right path of recovering its economy as, as the government is going to announce some serious measures that they're going to adapt at the, you know, uh, two sessions of the National People's Congress and so forth. And Korea could become an early bird of economic recovery too, and because, you know, we, we, we started early with China on this pandemic. <laughs> and I think we are on the verge of recovering from the pandemic too. So uh, uh, having said that, you know, Korea and China could be well positioned to lead the world's uh, economic recovery if we can become the early bird of the economic recovery. And the third is, I think the value of cooperation is going to be uh, reappreciated. Uh, I don't think there's going to be a strategic decoupling between the United States and China. Given ha having said that, you know, China and, and Korea might lead the way out of this horrendous economic situation and could contribute more to the world's economic uh, economic recovery. And if that's the case, uh, I think uh, the value of cooperation is going to be uh, reappreciated. And as someone as someone said, that's my fourth point. I think, uh, Haruko, you mentioned about it, uh, reconstructing of international institution to be well on the way after we, after the world has overcome this uh, horrendous situation. So basically what I'm saying is, okay, uh, I think the tenet of the title of my paper is going to be uh, challenges to the allies and the neighboring states of China. And obviously, you know, Haruko, you pointed out and also uh, June also pointed out that, you know, Korea could be well challenged by the interest of China and, as well as the United States. And uh, uh, June mentioned about, you know, EPN, you know, Economic Prosperity Network, and the United States is pressing hard on, on South Korea uh, on, the, on the situation with uh, Huawei. And uh, my takeaway is, uh, this will be my conclusion, Regardless of the situation, you know, although it looks like we are indulging in statism, nationalism, protectionism, and isolationism and encountering this situation, I think uh, our lessons of the history of the, you know, overcoming these uh, past crises is that there's only one thing you can really count on yourself, that's, that's value. And I think uh, if South Korea can stick to the value that it upholds, as well as if it abides to, then I don't, th I don't think that you know situation is going to be that complicated for South Korea to make uh, uh, any kind of choices that is that are presented by the United States and China. That's all. Thank you. Thanks, Ruko, and thanks everybody else. Uh, I'm not sure how much I can add actually, being the in the enviable position of being the last presenter in a panel of seven. Um, I, th I think really I can tie together some of the points being made before and maybe place a little more emphasis on the potential role for South Korea and other middle powers uh, in a new strategic order. In the current strategic operating environment, uh, as we've noted, the liberal international order faces the challenge of dual challenges, really. First of all, the, the abdication of leadership, U.S. leadership. Uh, but also the increasing contestation between the US and the other great powers, China and Russia. Linked to this uh, and for this panel, the responses of the, the three great powers to the COVID-19 crisis, as well as those of many of the high profile second tier powers, also leads much to be desired in terms of both international and domestic leadership. But the contemporary operating environment also opens new spaces for new actors. And I think chiefs among them are the East Asian middle powers, and in particular, South Korea. Uh, East Asian middle powers have looked to play a more independent regional leadership role, particularly in non-traditional security areas, such as 
COVID-19. Uh, so these sorts of avenues present East Asian middle powers with a, a, a noble opportunity to do something that's both normatively right and beneficial to others, while also in their, their national strategic and security interest. So the, the salience of newly rising East Asian actors, but also the importance of the contributions of civil societies in the region when it comes to NTS matters has been dramatically brought to the fore by this, this contemporary crisis. The governments and, and publics who have received the greatest plaudits for their handling of the, the COVID-19 crisis have predominantly been situated in the East Asian region. And these include uh, South Korea and Taiwan, and to a lesser extent, Singapore and Japan. Praise and criticism of East Asian governance for supposed Confucian models, I, I think misses the mark. That's a red herring. Likewise, it's a gross simplification to characterize Asian politics as leaning towards authoritarianism. And the idea that Asian polities and populaces somehow have an inherently anti-democratic or unenlightened bent, I think is frankly offensive. But there is a uniquely East Asian, and I mean Northeast and Southeast Asian here, take on international norms concerning governance and policy making, uh, which have also played out in the non-traditional security realm. And I look here to the, the interpretations of the, the human security paradigm and also the responsibility to protect paradigm in East Asia, which is clearly different from the interpretations that we see from the West. During the COVID-19 crisis, the successful measures such as contact tracing, mass testing, targeted lockdowns, could perhaps only have been implemented swiftly to such a degree in this region uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, so we can see a, something of a shared value system. I'm, I'm not gonna get into the Asian values debate, but at least a shared understanding across a broad geographic area or be it taking into account a, a wide range of governance models in this region. So it's been noted by some commentators that the most startling trend visible in the global COVID-19 pandemic is the vast differential separating East Asia from the West and that East Asia has handled and contained the pandemic far better than the West on nearly all metrics. South Korea in particular has seen an opportunity not only to continue its, its lengthy tradition of normative and humanitarian middle power niche diplomacy, but also to ramp up such endeavors, uh, building on its perceived successful response to the crisis. So the main way that, that Korea was able dramatically to reduce infections while not resorting to economically devastating lockdown was through a combination of aggressive testing and contact tracing, but also universal mask use. So the, the combination of government and society. On the government side, due to previous pandemic scares, preparations were already in place to ramp up dramatically the production of tests, masks, and PPE. Likewise, work had already been done on contact tracing technology, and this technology within the most connected society in the planet was not only reasonably well accepted in terms of ease of use, but also reasonably well accepted in terms of the social contract actually that June was, was mentioning earlier. People are already well used to wearing masks due to pollution uh, and willing to accept a degree of invasiveness in their lives because of national security considerations, whether it be North Korea or, or whether it be previous pandemics. President Moon Jae-in was elected on a social solidarity platform, and his government seems to have caught the zeitgeist here. When masks ran low, there's temptation to hoard or price gouge, the government stepped in. Early during the pandemic, we saw free hand sanitizer to be found next to and in the elevators of pretty much every building, whether it be uh, schools or workplaces, or whether just be apartment blocks. 
with a slow resurgence of infections, the cluster infections we're seeing now with something of a second wave in Korea, uh, tens of thousands of people were tested within days, uh, potentially infected, were contacted to six degrees of separation with the government cooperating with both phone companies and bank card issuers in this endeavor. And the wearing of masks is now mandatory on all forms of public transport. So this success has generated significant political ca capital for the country as a whole, and also for the political leadership. And we saw this in the elections, the uh, unprecedented election victory for the Democratic Party, and also booming opinion poll ratings for President Moon. So in his third anniversary of coming to power, Moon took the current crisis as a driving force for new opportunities and aspirations for a Republic of Korea that takes the lead in the world. And this is already evident from the new policy initiatives uh, that he's introduced before the crisis, such as the aspirational Northeast Asia plus community of responsibility to protect. Moon's statements marking the third anniversary of his inauguration represent a continuation of this policy, but also an attempt to, to drive it forward uh, as a normative middle power in the non-traditional security arena in this area. Uh, and as has already been noted, uh, Korea has been col collaborating with ASEAN on this front uh, and is looking to link to other middle powers in the NTS field. I've got lots more on linkages and spillover, but I'm gonna cut it there so that people have time to talk. What I found particularly interesting was uh, what Kay was talking about in terms of uh, bringing back ASEAN centrality, which I think is kind of a, it's, it might actually be the, the one very good way forward. Um, and and, the, and um, Jay Wu's optimism in, in US-China uh, uh, cooperation um, and June and Yang sort of very sort of a realistic look. <laughs> and um, I, as a, as a Japanese, I just feel very, very embarrassed that um, I, I don't know what my government is doing. I cannot, I cannot say with any confidence that, uh, but I do feel that uh, just one point I want to take on the Japan-Korea dimension um, is that uh, this is very much contingent on um, the leaders. Um, I think it really takes two to tango and Moon, President Moon and um, Prime Minister Abe Shinzo could not have been a worse um, combination. Um, I still cannot explain why um, Prime Minister Abe's cabinet as a whole um, tends to be very sort of um, biased towards Korea. Uh, particularly because when they when we installed the the the, the entry ban, um, the first two countries were Korea and China. When um, there was already a huge outbreak in in Iran and Italy, and I am not surprised that the Korean government were actually quite annoyed and furious uh, that why Korea should be seen, you know. Uh, be the target. Um, and so I think there were some real diplomatic missteps uh, on the part of the, the, the Abe, Abe government. And as I said, I have, I, you know, it, it's very difficult to explain, especially uh, Abe cabinet's um, Korea policy. Um, and because it does seem that uh, they must have some agenda in, in wanting to either uh, act as a US agent, for example, to, to, to really make Korea decide one way or the other which country they're going to be with, either China or the US, or it's just um, a, a very domestically driven agenda um, where we do have uh, still the, the Zainichi issues um, and uh, also about, you know, the fragmentation of, of Japanese society that is trying to sort of also, on, on one hand, address the aging society and is under huge pressure to, to bring in uh, more foreign workers. And the natural source would either be Chinese, Koreans, or Southeast Asians. 
So um, I think there is a, but these are all still un inarticulate um, um, political forces or uh, currents that I do think are, must be affecting um, policy decisions, or at least in terms of how, uh, with Korea, but I don't know. So um, I'm going to, uh, okay, um, I have a question. So um, if you, are you okay with, Brenda, do you have any comments? Yeah, well, actually, I can build on what you're saying and on the questions, uh, the discussion about ASEAN and response to the second half of the question that, that's kicked in here, which I believe is for me. Um, first of all, uh, I think ASEAN has a very important role to play, but also it should be seen in the context of the East Asian community, so ASEAN plus three. Uh, and I, I think that is the where we might be able to get some, some progress. And this actually also builds into the functional cooperation element. Uh, maybe Japan and Korea can overcome their differences in this, this wider operating environment. Uh, in response to the actual question that I, I received there, uh, that I talk about Asian values. No, I actually reject Asian values. Uh, I certainly do not think that all of Northeast Asia is the same. And certainly even more do I think that it's dangerous to talk about all of Northeast Asia and all of Southeast Asia is the same. However, what I have found in the policy statements of governments in Northeast Asia and Southeast Asia across the board is even when they sign up to and accept uh, liberal, universal principles like human security and the responsibility to protect at the UN, they make it clear they have a very different understanding of the implications for that, for those principles, for both domestic and international governance. And I think that the understanding between these different Asian societies, East Asian societies, these understandings have more in common with each other than, say, democracies in East Asia and democracies in Western Europe. I think it's clearly, if you look at the human security initiatives in both Canada and Japan, who are early trailblazers in human security, they came to a very different decisions about how human security could be promoted and the implications of it, especially if you, for instance, look at Myanmar. So I think this is what we need to build on. Uh, if we're looking for any light at the end of the tunnel in terms of regional cooperation or regional organization, it is this, this functional level shared understanding of the implications of certain norms. Um, okay, uh, I have another question from, uh, are you able to read um, from um, Bryce? Bryce Wakefield from Australia, um, and it's a question to uh, Yang. Mm -hmm. um, it says, I think the picture you paint of China's willingness to cooperate in international efforts to deal with COVID would seem rosy in Australia, uh, which has been pushing for an international investigation into the origins of the mm -hmm. pandemic. Okay. Um, and Australia was condemned by Chinese diplomats and media and the decision to slap crippling tariffs on Australian agricultural producers are being seen here as retaliation. New Zealand and other nations were harshly criticized by Beijing when suggested that Taiwan be invited to join the WHO. Um, can we really say that the Chinese government is willing to cooperate on handling the crisis when it doesn't seem to want to cooperate on what is fairly reasonable international court to investigate the origins or successful handling of the crisis so that we may understand future pandemics? I think that's a reasonable question, actually. Oh, Thanks, Chris. Okay. Can, can I respond now? Yes, please. I think that's a very good question indeed. And I think uh, my answer would not be that sat satisfactory to, to a lot of people, but I think uh, understanding Chinese, fo Chinese foreign policy really has to distinguish issues of political nature and non-political nature. 
And of course, um, you know, how do you separate these two areas? That's a, that's a very, very nuanced question in itself. I think, you know, um, before we move on to talk about Australia, you know, the question of uh, the, uh, you know, the practice of cooperation or coordination was there between the, um, at the technical and of course scientific level between the Chinese CDC and the US CDC. So there wasn't much of a dispute over there. I mean, and of course, you know, within the Chinese context and the Chinese government is very upset in the sense that, you know, Australia has been talking about cover up and latching onto the US uh, sort of a, a, a coattail of what is a cover up. And, and of course, the things were building up between in, in the relationship between China and Australia, because Australia was the first country that really um, kind of amped up the talk and of course, domestic contestation of Chinese influence uh, operations overseas. So I think, uh, you know, it goes both ways, but I think the actual technical aspect of that, uh, you know, in terms of cooperation, in terms of developing vaccine, in terms of information sharing, that, that is strictly non-political, I think it's still workable. What is, what really upsets the Chinese government from the, the Australians was really about, you know, at least the perceived nature of uh, asking for international inquiry. That's like, uh, you know, open, uh, you know, that's like opening up a jar of politics that, that really upsets the Chinese government because, I mean, on the one hand, they talk about sovereignty. On the other hand, really opens up the, um, the dirty laundry of a local government cover up, which they really obviously do not want to talk about. Right, so I think, um, you know, I hope, I'm not sure that answers the question well, but um, yeah, we can certainly. Ming do you that. have any, any, any view on this? OHA, right, uh, the assembly, there was a uh, agreement, a sort of um, policy adopted by all parties. Uh, there will be some sort of international investigation, but it will be more scientific in nature. So I agree with uh, Xiang Feng uh, in that China was trying to resist the political aspect of uh, the call for investigation. And, and in a specific context of, you know, US and other countries blaming China, um, asking for compensations and uh, you know, some of the lawsuits, various organizations and individuals have um, launched, uh, launched against China. So I, I think uh, people in Beijing may um, be very worried about, you know, politics um, behind all this international call for investigation. Uh, all, overall, in terms of um, um, medical protection equipment, supplies, and scientific um, research, I, I tend to agree with Xiangfu. I think China does have pretty strong interest in cooperation. But when it comes to some of the you know, controversial, you know, political driven issues, of course, uh, you will see quite a bit of resistance. Oh, um, I have a, an answer from, an interjection from Kay about the Vietnam thing. Hi, uh, thank you very much. Uh, so the uh, question, I think the, uh, um, uh, we got the, the uh, from Yin Li, uh, the, about the, uh, Vietnamese chairmanship of the ASEAN this year. Um, I think the uh, Vietnam actually really shifted its focus um, from the, uh, um, the uh, I think the agenda they focused on uh, previous year that it's more like the uh, kind of security and the political issues, uh, which has the, uh, uh, the implication for the South China Sea issue. Um, but then the, uh, this year, because of the uh, emergence of the uh, COVID-19, uh, the Vietnam actually tried to uh, do more kind of the uh, show the uh, cooperative posture to the uh, East Asian uh, countries. And the, uh, um, this is a really, uh, I think the, uh, they are actually dealing uh, the uh, situation uh, pretty well uh, in terms of the uh, managing the uh, uh, ASEAN conference and then so on and so forth. And also um, Vietnam uh, tried to push forward uh, some of the uh, agenda uh, that is has the uh, I think they, they propose the four uh, the uh, uh, four things right now. Other uh, one is the uh, uh, establishment of the uh, ASEAN fund uh, the uh, counter uh, on the uh, counter uh, coronavirus uh, the COVID nineteen, and the second one is the uh, uh, 
trying to develop uh, the uh, uh, medical supplies for the region. And third one is the, uh, uh, as I said uh, in my presentation, uh, try to create the uh, ASEAN stand standard procedure uh, among the uh, member states. And then uh, fourth one is the uh, uh, formulating the uh, some plan uh, the, uh, for the uh, post uh, COVID-19. So I think the, uh, they are uh, just kind of try to focus on countering the uh, COVID-19 and then putting aside, not completely, but like putting aside the, uh, some like traditional security issues uh, that the, uh, they wanted to focus on last year. So uh, Vietnam is, I think they are handling pretty well uh, in that sense. And then the, uh, whether this actually leads to the uh, further integration among the uh, Southeast Asian countries and beyond, I don't know. I think that this is just kind of more like response to the uh, situation. And then the, uh, it depends on the, uh, to what uh, degree uh, those uh, the member states try to put their uh, kind of uh, political and then diplomatic resources or economic financial resources on that integration scheme. But like for that, and uh, the, to the, um, I think I'm a little bit uh, pessimistic about the uh, integration perspective, but a like functional uh, kind of response, Vietnam is doing pretty well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, I'm going to um, pick uh, the two, two questions that have come in. One is for, for you, Ming Zhang, uh, from Xue. You can probably read it. It's about whether China's efforts to shaping the narratives is handling the crisis has been successful or not. And then the final question, the next one is from Cesar, um, and it's about it's directed to us, you and Jewu, uh, Jewu and me, um, about the 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 who is be the WHO becoming sino China centric, um, and the U.S. and how are the Japanese and the Korean governments are responding to it? So I'll go with Lee Ming Jiang and then Jewu and then I'll answer. Is that okay? Sure, sure. Yeah, well, very very quickly because I understand we're running out of time. Uh, overall, I would see um, China's handling of this narrative politics um, has been a failure. <laughs> Unfortunately, I mean, if you look at what has happened, so politics uh, has really led to very significant negative consequences for China. Um, from hindsight, I think they should have probably done a better job. For instance, they should have tried um, make it clear that origin of virus and outbreak of pandemic are two different things, right? When the international community was calling for investigation of the origin of um, the virus, I mean, it, it could be explained from a scientific uh, point of view, right? But politics, the politicians were fumbling or you know, saying things that were stupid. And they were even trying to deny the fact that the outbreak first occurred in Wuhan, right? So, you know, in this confusion of origin versus uh, outbreak and the um, basically lost uh, the uh, credibility. Um, uh, and that's one. And second, I, I think the Chinese leaders should have been more honest and uh, uh, um, straightforward in admitting some of the early you know, problems and mistakes. And that's not really fundamentally damage, right? Uh, China and the government and the party. But people in China were so vigilant, were so um, strong in guarding against any external criticism. It really um, puts China constantly on the defensive. And so, but, uh, and of course the so-called uh, warrior wolf, wolf warrior in the diplomacy, some of the Chinese uh, diplomats, the senior diplomats, you know, what they did were, were not, not really commendable, in my opinion. So, okay, I'll stop there. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Um, so, Jay Wu, um, would you like to? Yes, very quick and brief. Uh, South Korean government has maintaining has been maintaining you know, very low profile and low key when it comes to criticism coming out of Washington DC against China because South Korean government has only one goal in their mind and that is the realization of Xi Jinping's <laughs> visit to South Korea and they, they, they want it really to happen. So any criticism coming from Washington DC, they're not going to dance to the tune at all and they're going to show it 
remain very low uh, when it comes to you know any any criticism critical of China. They're not going to make you make any kind of immediate reaction at all. Mm. Yeah. Um, I think in, in the Japanese case, um, I have um, actually two, one interesting question, which I think uh, it was directed to June, um, but I'll just say very quickly about Japan. Uh, and um, it's basically like with the South China Sea issue, you know, Japan is actually just gonna say, we like to see rule-based behavior. Um, and you won't hear the Japanese government taking a position, commenting one way or the other about the, 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 the they might worry, they probably will worry, but um, anything to do with uh, that would have them come down with um, an, an, um, taking sides as much as they might really prefer that the Koreans do it too. But um, I think that's basically the position. Um, and I think this is something to do with our government, particularly right now, um, it, uh, of uh, having aimed for a very high profile in the beginning, it's kind of unable to fill those shoes uh, when something is of this magnitude um, happens. So that's my view. Anyway, um, uh, I know that there's a question from um, Alfredo, but I think this is very specific and it goes to Korea, but I'd like to take up Anama's question, uh, which is, uh, is directed to June. Um, that uh, we shouldn't not look at Asian cases as de facto solutions that can be applied to other countries. However, why do you think Europe and the US have largely ignored Asia in COVID-19 responses? And I think this might actually be a very good question to an answer to end the panel. So, June. So, mm. Okay, so for Alfredo, I uh, attached a small link over there, uh, which I published last year. And if you have any questions after reading that, then I would be more than happy to answer. Then from Anoma, uh, regarding the conceptualization of the Asian cases and why Europe and the US largely ignored Asia in the beginning, I think first and foremost, the concept of data privacy in Europe is huge. And uh, the kind of conditional, conditional uh, data access by the government, uh, Big Brother in, in some ways, um, in the South Korean context, which occurred specifically because of mares, was not really there in either the US and uh, the, uh, Europe, uh, not just the European Union and in general, but in overall European societies. And I think another thing to consider, I don't want to use the word Confucianism here, but uh, just a little bit related to what Brendan mentioned in terms of East Asianist, Northeast Northeast Asian is, I think there is a difference between the degree of individualism and collectivism in um, quote unquote East and West societies. So if there is a social contract that could be reached within the European um, context or the American context, perhaps there's food for thought, uh, but I don't think it would be easy to pass the similar context of a uh, uh, legislation in Europe or in the US in the degree of data privacy, data access in the South Korean context as in the Infectious Diseases Prevention and Control Act. Because it was very, uh, you need to have experienced it and then you need to realize that you need, uh, you, you, you want change. But that kind of change may not occur because of the seriousness uh, of data privacy in Europe and the US. Mm. Thank you. Brendan, do you have a word before I hand everything over to Joe? Uh, basically, I, I pretty much agree with what June just said, so I'll leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, all right, so here ends. Thank you very much for the extra 10 minutes extension, and thank you everybody on the panel. And for those students, uh, all of them, actually most of them are my students, who sent questions. Thank you very much. Uh, now I'll hand it over to Joe. Thank you very much, Hadako. Thank you very much, everyone, for, for taking part in that. It was a great discussion, and I'm sure that it's going to excite a lot of people's uh, interest in, um, in, the, in the different countries and the different perspectives that you've been given, and, um, and I expect quite a lot of discussion going forward. Um, we're